Hi, I'm going to go ahead and take a few minutes and explain a very uh, crucial aspect of mental health, and that is the topic of confidentiality as well as the duty to warn when it comes to a mental health professional. And I'll use the term mental health professional to denote that it's not just therapists that need to understand this difference. It's not just psychologists. It's not just psychiatrists. It's not just licensed professional counselors uh, or marriage and family therapists and or social workers. So I use the term mental health professionals to encompass that entire umbrella because the two cases that I'm going to review here in this video are um, going to be relevant to all mental health professionals. So I'll be looking down and I'll be reading through some of the uh, Supreme Court opinions that were written on both of these cases that are precedent setting cases. Uh, one is a Supreme Court of California decision as well as one that is a Supreme Court of Texas decision. Uh, both have had serious implications when it comes to the legal mandates um, facing mental health professionals in the United States and then in the state of Texas. And the importance for needing to know the difference between the two are um, huge because the two Supreme Court cases essentially um, contradict one another. And so it's important to know which one you have to follow and knowing and following the mandates and the statutes set, uh, set forth by your specific state is going to determine uh, several things. One, if there are going to be any criminal charges um, held against you, any civil penalties, and or if the board of examiners that regulates your specific licensure, whether it's the psychology board, uh, counseling board, marriage and family board, social work board, or any other mental health related um, board of examiners, you could potentially uh, face losing your licensure if um, you don't know or follow these statutes correctly. So uh, first off, I'll talk about the Tarasoff versus the Regents of the University of California ruling that was um, decided on July 1st, 1976. So here, uh, just to give you an overview of the important topics of this case, what ended up happening, so you know the main characters, if you will, um, Mr. Podar, who was a client in this case, um, was a UC Berkeley graduate student who developed an attraction for the victim in this case, Tatiana uh, Tarasov. And so they met at an event. Um, and so there were some exchanges of words between the two. They uh, allegedly kissed and he was infatuated with uh, Tatiana. Tarasov, and so developed this very much uh, deep sense of um, love or attraction to her. Um, he was also obtaining outpatient therapy from a psychologist at the UC Berkeley uh, hospital at the time. And so He disclosed at some point when he felt rejected by Tatiana. Tatiana had said, I don't want anything to do with you. And he felt very rejected with that. She had taken in that uh, summer of 69, she went to Brazil. And so he had disclosed in his therapy sessions to his psychologist that when she comes back from Brazil, he's going to kill her. Um, that was alarming to the psychologist who went up the chain of command to his supervisor and ultimately reported the threat to the campus police whom uh, detained Mr. Podar for a period of less than 72 hours. And that's important to note because that puts the burden on 
uh, the law enforcement if they kept somebody for less than 24 hours or rather less than 72 hours or they kept them more than that time period. So regardless, he, he was kept for less than 72 hours. Uh, what's known is it was about 24 hours that he was held. And once they determined that he was in fact rational and um, was not hallucinating or having delusions, they went ahead and released him. Um, so we fast forward. So now this is around August 20th, 1969, that he informed his psychologist that once she comes back from Brazil, he's going to kill her. So we fast forward a couple of months to October, October 27th, 1969. He, um, enters Tatiana's apartment, shoots her, and stabs her 17 times, um, killing her. And so after her death, the parents of Tatiana go and sue the psychologist as well as the police department, citing that they did not protect um, their daughter the way they should have. So several charges were brought up in that case. Uh, Four of them specifically, one was that there was a failure to detain a dangerous patient. That was one of the charges. The second charge was there was a failure to warn on a dangerous patient. Um, then the third charge was that there was an abandonment of a da dangerous patient. And last but not least, that there was a breach of primary duty to patient and the public. So these were the uh, charges that were filed because the mental health professionals had released Porar less than 72 hours, the Supreme Court of California ruled that the law enforcement had no liability here and that the liability went back to the mental health professionals. Um, long story short, um, the ruling as it came down from the Supreme Court of California was that in fact the mental health professionals had a duty to warn uh, the victim and or other individuals uh, identified as a potential victim in this case, as the parents were um, alleging that they should have informed either the parents or Tatiana herself that there is a uh, threat made against your life and so therefore you need to know to be able to protect yourself. Well, the mental health professionals in this case, their defense was we did not know Tatiana. We don't have a relationship established with Tatiana. So why are we to uh, make, make disclosures about Tatiana uh, to whoever identified victim is because that breaches the confidentiality that Podar here had which is one of our utmost uh, important factors that we always need to keep in mind the confidentiality of a patient or a client is of utmost importance because it creates a sense of confidence for our profession to even continue to do the uh, job or the duties that it's tasked with. Uh, regardless, the Supreme Court of California ruled against that being the case and said that no mental health professionals in fact have the duty to warn not only uh, the potential victim but also law enforcement and uh, ensure that the public is uh, safe as well. So one of the things that they noted in that case was that um, if I can find it yes that they cited in their um, opinion piece was that the protective privilege ends where the public peril begins. So the justices wrote that, that yes, you do have confidentiality. However, that confidentiality and or privilege ends where there is a public threat. And so therefore you are mandated by law to disclose that potential threat to the identified victim and or the public in order to protect them. So uh, that, that, that became a precedent-setting case in 1969 that essentially became the rule of the land, if you will, 
that many of the states around the United States began to practice, that uh, a mental health professional had the obligation to disclose a threat that's made against someone else. So now we fast forward to the 80s. So uh, since this one was decided in the 70s, we, we fast forward a decade and we talk about then a case that is Thapar versus Zuzulka in the state of Texas with some similarities and some differences. So the similarities are, so to give you a timeline so you understand this one, uh, Mr. Freddie Ray Lilly, referred to as Lilly, um, he was a Vietnam War veteran and upon his return from Vietnam, he began to live with his stepfather and mother um, in a trailer behind their house. And so he began getting volunteer um, treatment, which was diagnosed by the uh, psychiatrist, Dr. Thapart, Thapar here, um, and was diagnosed with moderate to severe PTSD. He uh, disclosed that he would have nightmares, flashbacks, um, paranoia, and things like that. And um, specifically, those delusions were towards uh, the Vietnamese uh, individuals, African Americans, and his stepfather, um, Henry Zuzulka. Okay, so there were a couple of incidents between 1985 and 1988 uh, when. Lily killed Zuzulka, his stepfather. So in that three-year period, there were several uh, admissions to a psychiatric facility. So he was first admitted in July of 1985. Then he was discharged. He was then readmitted again in July of 1986. And a month later, he was discharged. Um, then he struggled with alcohol abuse and substance abuse during that time period. So he was again readmitted three times in 1987, and in 1988 he was admitted again another uh, two times to the psychiatric facility, and in August of 1988, the doctor had noted in her notes that Lily had disclosed that he had homicidal ideation and wanted to kill his stepfather, but further in the notes it was note notated that no, he had really decided not to kill the stepfather, even though that's how he was feeling. So we move forward, September 28th, 1988. Uh, Mr. Lilly carries out his plans and kills stepfather. And then the deceased, uh, the deceased's wife, so here Mrs. Zuzulka, who was the mother of uh, Freddie Lilly sues uh, the par, the psychiatrist, saying that she also had a duty to warn not only uh, Mr. Zuzulka, the stepfather, but also potentially her as the mother of uh, Freddie, um, because here, as a result of what had happened and uh, the par's failure to warned them she had now lost her son as well as her husband. So this uh, court case went several uh, years back and forth before it finally landed in front of the Texas Supreme Court and the case was finally decided in June on June 24th 1999. And here the Texas Supreme Court's decision was um, in complete contradiction to the California Supreme Court decision. So if you recall, the California Supreme Court decision was that the mental health professional had a obligation and a mandate to disclose a uh, threat. The Supreme Court of Texas ultimately decided that no, in the state of Texas, confidentiality precedes all else. And the mental health professional 
uh, though by the legislature already set, uh, legislation already set in the state of Texas, is allowed by law to disclose uh, potential threats. However, there is no common law um, that says that they are mandated to or required to disclose a potential threat about a um, situation to anybody, uh, whether or not the party is involved in the therapeutic relationship. So the concerns that the Supreme Court of Texas brought up was that what ends up happening in the situation if we mandate the mental health professional to disclose we're in fact telling them to breach confidentiality which will invite the client or the patient to then sue the client or sue the therapist rather um, though that was their intent i think that ended up happening anyway because as it stands right now in the state of texas you are again allowed by law to disclose a potential threat or a duty to warn if you will um, however you're not required to so either way it goes you're still going to be facing the dilemma of potentially getting sued by the client if you do disclose because they're going to claim breach of confidentiality and if you don't uh, disclose and they carry out their plans and somebody gets killed chances are that you're going to get um, a lawsuit filed against you for negligence and or uh, not uh, carrying out your duty to warn. So this is where we go back to the other video that I'd recorded earlier and the discrepancy that exists between code of ethics as well as um, laws and statutes. As you can very clearly see, legally, there are two different rulings here. In California, you are mandated by law to disclose, and if you don't disclose, then you're going to be facing criminal charges and or potential even civil. In the state of Texas, you don't have any such obligation. Um, so you're free to determine what you want to do, which brings it into the ethical realm for you. What you determine to be most ethical uh, thing to do. What my recommendation would be that you determine what your um, desire is now that there is no such a case uh, facing you. So determine what is my uh, ethics tell me. Does Do my uh, ethical guidelines and or more, my moral obligations tell me that if a client discloses to me a potential plan to kill someone, will I go ahead and disclose that information in both their interests so you keep them out of jail and you keep them from further uh, criminal and or um, civil penalties, but also protecting the other third party, whoever the identified victim is, or do you choose to keep everything confidential and keep it there with your clients and then have to defend in court uh, the rationale of why you did not uh, disclose the threat to the potential victim and now there was somebody dead. So bottom line, which case do you want to, uh, to present a defense for? Do you want to A, um, say I disclosed and therefore so-and-so is alive and sitting in this courthouse or B, no, I kept my right to keep this information confidential and therefore so-and-so is dead, but I had no liability or um, obligation to that person as they were not my client and this person sitting in front of me was. So that's a determination that you'll have to make um, and I don't want to feed you one way or another. So uh, I'll leave you with that. However, I will say one more thing, and this is also a very, very crucial aspect of clinical mental health practice, and that is this is where um, your informed consent and your service agreement with a client becomes of utmost importance because you could clearly lay out your specific policies and or agendas right there. So you could put where there are limits of confidentiality in your informed consent and if you have put the client on notice that if they do threaten to harm someone or kill someone, 
and or do anything like that, that you will uh, disclose this information to a third party. That way, you're essentially protecting yourself from the potential lawsuit that might come from your client saying that there was a breach of confidentiality because, in fact, you have informed them that if that's what they disclose to you, you reserve the right to go ahead and disclose that information to a third party for both protecting them as well as protecting the public and or whoever the individuals might be. So um, that's very, very much crucial that you have your informed consents and service agreement laid out accurately and correctly from the onset and prior to the therapy um, process starting. So hope this gives you a little bit of a uh, better understanding between the Tarasov case as well as the, the Parr versus Zulka case. Um, obviously, if you're in Texas, you have to follow the Texas law. If you're in California, you have to carry the, out the California law. And if you happen to be practicing in a different state, make sure you find out what the rules and the statutes of your specific state are as it, re as it relates to mental health um, duty to warn situations. There are 45 states um, that either require or permit a mental health professional to disclose uh, potential threats. So it's, it just depends on the state that you're in and if you have any further questions, feel free to email me. You'll see my email at the bottom. And um, otherwise, have a wonderful day. Take care.